All right, in this video, we're going to look a little bit about how you can use Leaflet. Um, Leaflet is an extraordinary package. It's in that HTML widget suite, and it lets you create interactive maps that are really, really interesting, and they're, they're really actually quite straightforward um, just from what you would start with working with data frames. So I'm going to start by setting up the data we're going to use for this. Um, part of it is some data that I've already cleaned and put into an R data frame format. And it's got fatal automobile accidents from 2001 to 2010 in Colorado. Um, the other part is we're going to grab the, the, the boundaries for tracks from the U.S. Census using the Tigris data set. And we've used that some before when we've worked with mapping. So let's get the tracks first. We're going to use the Tigris library for that. And then um, we're going to specify what state. And we'll actually get these just for Denver. So these are kind of small. So if we got them for the whole state, it would be a lot to have. And we're really just going to focus on Denver today. And then we don't need these to be super, super refined. So we'll set some of the specifications for that. And you used to have to specify the class equals SF. I think this is the default now. So you could probably leave this out and it would be fine. So we'll put that in. One of the nice things about Tigris is all of the functions are named after the geographic um, type of area you want to get. So like, if, if you want to get counties, it's counties. If you want to get tracts, it's tracts. If you want to get states, it's states. All right. And then the county that we wanted to get, I believe, was 31 for Denver. Right. Again, I'm going to try this without the class equals SF because I believe that should be the default now. To check that, if we want to, we can come down and run Denver tracks. And we can do that with class. I don't know if I've loaded tidyverse. We might need to, no, no, we've got Magreeder just with Tigris. Yes, so it's got that as an SF automatically now. That's their default. All right, the other piece that we're going to get, again, is something that I've already got cleaned up. So you can click on this link, and that will take you into GitHub where you can get it. Once you get here, you'll want to click on download to get the whole thing. Uh, that might take a second for you to get it. I think it might be a little large. And then once you do, I'm going to move it in to the, the folder that I have, the, the R project that I have for kind of teaching this class, and I've got a, a data subdirectory in that. So we've got it right here. We can move it right in there. Great. All right. So when you have data, you can save data in this .r data, and then you just load it in, uh, which is pretty convenient. I don't teach that a whole lot, because if you're working with anything that isn't kind of a really large or ungainly data set, it's, um, it's nice to have it in a plain text format. And this isn't plain text. This is binary. So you could only open it with R. You're not going to be able to really see anything if you open it with something else. So I think it is normally better to save with CSV or something like that. But this is a good example of seeing how you can work with data that's in this R data format if somebody shares that with you. So we're going to do load, and then we need to do the relative file path. Um, we're starting in a project here. And so we our home working directory right now is that project directory. So we need to go into the subdirectory of data. And then if you want, you can use tab completion to see what options you have there. And this is the one that we want. Once you load that, you can list the files that you have in your working directory. And you can see we've got this new one. So we created Denver Tracks. That's how we got that one. But this driver data, that's the data that was loaded when we did this load call. So that's what was stored inside that file. If we want, we can look at that. So this is from um, a federal accident reporting system through the United States, and it records every fatal automobile accident in the, in the United States, and it records information like the latitude and longitude. Um, so this is actually by driver, so in some cases we might have two records in here for the same accident if there were two cars, or, or even three if there were three cars or, or more. Um, and so we're going to do a little bit to clean that up as we go along. But this has some information like the state. This is limited right now, so they're all in Colorado. It's got a case number, the county, and here we'll be limiting this just to Denver, which is this county equals 31. 
It's got the date and the time that it happened, latitude and longitude, the number of fatalities. Um, it also has some information about the driver. So if the driver was, um, if there were one or more drunk drivers in that accident, involved in that accident, um, the age of the driver, and then some information about an alcohol test. So the other part that we're going to do now that we've read this in is clean it up just a little bit. So I'll load tidyverse. And then we're going to select just a few of the columns and filter to the county. Um, so it's in Denver. And then there was one where the longitude was, was really far off uh, that obviously was coded wrong. So we're going to use this longitude just to clean that up and kick out that one. And then we'll use distinct so that if we have multiple records for a certain accident, in terms of state, the, the case number, the county longitude, latitude, and all of that. If we have anything that are exact duplicates for these columns we have left, it will limit to just one record for each of those. Let me make sure I load a tidy verse. Okay, so we can look now, we'll do that, that, that actually. And you can see we've limited some of our columns now and we've actually also reduced some of the rows because we're limiting only to distinct cases and only the ones that happened in Denver by picking this county equals 31. So this is what we'll work with as we go through and do the example from Leaflet. All right, to use Leaflet, you need to make sure that you have the Leaflet package installed. And then you'll, you'll load it as you would with any package with Leaflet. Let's do that up here. I need to install it on this computer. step is if we want to just start creating that leaflet object, just like with ggplot, when we want to create a ggplot object, we do ggplot by itself, and then we add layers onto that. This is going to work the same way. We're going to start just by creating this kind of leaflet object, and it's going to start out being blank, but then we'll fill it in with stuff. So we can do leaflet, and if we run just that, you'll see over here, it opens in your viewer, which can is running as a browser, so it can handle all of this stuff that, that needs JavaScript to, to kind of run and let you interact with it. Uh, but right now it's just empty. There's nothing there. So we need to add layers just like we do with ggplot. So if we want to add tiles with the, the world map behind them, we can do this add tiles. So by default, that's going to give us the whole world. Once we start adding points, it'll kind of zoom in just to, to the spot, um, kind of the border of our points, or you can specify what you want for the boundary for it to start with. But already you can kind of see how this is interactive. You can zoom in, and then you can pan around. And what this is doing, um, especially as we start using these provider tiles, like they're fancier backgrounds you can use, it's actually going and pulling the tiles um, for the resolution you're zoomed into and for the space you've pinned to at that point. So actually, if you zoom around kind of quickly, you'll see their gray spaces that you're, gray, you're, you're zooming into. That's where it's still lagged a little bit in getting the tiles to represent that. These are also, I should do a note of warning, so these are amazing for exploring stuff on your computer. Um, I hesitate to put them in presentations, even though you can do HTML slides for presentations, because a lot of times by the time you get to the slide with that presentation, it's kind of like timed out on the tiles and it's all gray in the background and you have to refresh and all of that. All right, so we've just gone through this step in the slides where we, we installed Leaflet and we're using that, and we've gone through and done leaflet to create the leaflet object, and then the add tiles piece that actually brings in those tiles for our map. So it looks like this. Uh, now this is just the background. We probably want to do something from this point. Like we want to add in the data that we have like about the accidents. So we can do that using um, different kinds of objects. 
And one that's very, very helpful is the markers. Like those are a lot like, like adding, um, adding points when you're doing a scatter plot. So you can do add markers. And just like when we did the mapping with those GMSF, we're gonna specify the data when we add that layer. So we can come in here and do add markers and then our data equals, and we have this accident data that we want to use, so that's what we'll put in. Then the next thing, if we're starting from a data frame for this, we need to let it know which columns give the latitude and the longitude. So let's take a look at this data again. So latitude is right here with the latitude, and longitude, it's missing its E, but it's right here. So we can do lat equals, and this is a tricky thing. This is a little bit different from working with ggplot. If you're referencing one of the columns in this data set you just specified, in these conventions for leaflet, you need to put a tilde before it that says, look in that data frame and it'll be a column there, rather than looking for this as an object somewhere else in the R environment. All right, so we'll put that in this latitude and then one. Uh, LNG. All right, so now you can see it is out of the markers for each of those accident locations. So each of the latitudes and longitudes we had in this data set, it's added onto the map. And now by default, it will be zoomed in to the boundary of these locations. We can still zoom out if we want to, we can zoom further in, but when it first creates the map, it's going to be um, zoomed in to be right around the boundary of those. You can also put in different things when you're creating these maps. So you could put in um, what's called an SP object, and in that case, you don't need to specify uh, some of that information. But I think that it's really convenient, and probably 90% of the time when I'm using this, I'm starting from a data frame I have where I have a column for latitude and a column for longitude. And so in those cases, you'll use these conventions of specifying which column is longitude, which is latitude, and then passing in your data with the data argument. All right, you can also start from a simple features object, or you can start from just a matrix that's got latitude and longitude, and then it's got the values inside the matrix. You can also do circles if you want. So we just did the markers. Those are kind of like these pinpoints, but instead we can do circle markers by just calling it the add circle markers. So you can see these are circles like this, and then that's got different arguments that you can use um, for the size of them. So we can put in radius, and let's try maybe two. So you can see that it's smaller, and as you zoom in, it's going to kind of ret retain that size as you zoom in or out. You can also put in some interesting things when you're doing these markers. One that I think is really great is the cluster option. So this will actually show the number of points in an area when there are lots of them and when they might be overlapping. But then as you zoom in, it will resolve into the, the specific pinpoint locations of those. So let's go back, we're gonna go back to using the add markers, and this time we're gonna do cluster options equals marker cluster options. So that's another function that comes with, um, with leaflet. All right. All right, so when we run this, you can see when we're zoomed out, it's telling us there are 262 events that happened in this area. There are 72 that happened in this area, just six out here near the airport, 130, so on. And then as you zoom in, you'll see that they split apart. So we have kind of more resolved areas. And then as we zoom in further and further, eventually they'll split up so much that we have the individual point markers for where specific accidents happen. So this is a really nice way to be able to see something that you can interpret easily both when you're, you're zoomed out a lot or when you zoom in and you want to see things very finely resolved. 
All right, the next thing that you can do is you can change the matte background that you use. Um, and this is actually really fun. There are a lot of choices for that. And so you can really be creative and pick up something that works well for the, the things that you want to visualize and really makes any of the, the kind of colors or pieces you want to show pop out. So for this, instead of doing add tiles, we're going to do add provider tiles. And right now, I'll just put in this one example, but then I'll show you where you can find these little codes to use to figure them out. All right, so we'll change this to provider. And then in quotation marks, we put in the choice. So I'm going to do this one. All right, so you can see that our background's changed now. And as you zoom in and out, you'll see some of the, some of the differences. So this one, um, certainly it, it, it's not quite as resolved in terms of roads and things like that and it's got kind of like a prettier one but it, it it's more in the background maybe than if you have a lot of details about roads and cities and, and all those kinds of markers. Um, here's another one we can use this S3 World Street Map and I believe S3 is the company that does ArcGIS so this might look familiar from that. Yeah. So you can see that that's got some more information about the different locations. To find the full list of these and what codes to use for each of them, you can go to this site. It's got all of these different tiles. And over here on the right, it has all of the options. And you can scroll through. If you see one that you think is interesting, then you can click on that and you can see an example of what it would look like. You can also try scrolling in and see what it looks like scrolled in and scrolled out and all of that. And then once you pick the one that you would like to use, you get the name from right here. So this one would be thunderforest.mobileatlas. So we could just go in here and do thunderforest. Make sure I spelled that right. I'm not sure it grabs that one. Let's try another one. Let's see. We've got, there's some on here that are actually from NASA and from, um, from the USGS. Let's try this one. So these are the lights at night from NASA. There we go. This one might not work with the poster marker. Let's try it without. It seems to work a little better. Yeah, so you can scroll out and, and see kind of how that works. I don't know if this would be the best choice for this data. But um, yeah, so you can pick whichever one you want and then you use just this code in the central part for the ad provider tiles.